Martin, how are you doing? I'm all right. I've just come back from General Synod. I came back yesterday. It's Matthew 13 and the classic enigmatic parable of the sower. What do you make of this? What is Jesus trying to communicate here? I say trying. Who no, am no, I to patronise no, no, Jesus? I, I was listening to, listening to your tone of voice. I thought, <laughs> I, okay, it, it, you, you, were, you were reminding me of some commentator on the on the te television, just drawing out your your words and <laughs> phrases. Um, so, uh, interestingly, I I you know, I've been ordained forty four forty four years. I can't remember preaching on this parable. Huh. Now, it does only appear in the Matthew year, but of course, you know, for a long time, we were on a different lectionary uh, mm. in, in those 45, 44 years. Um, so it only appears once in the three-year lectionary. But it is nevertheless a very familiar parable. Mm. People people know, you say, talk about the parable, so people know it. And so I am preaching on it this Sunday in Swahili, in Tanzania. Well, if you could keep to the English for today. Oh, <laughs> there's, there's no danger of me lapsing into <laughs> Swahili. Um, and, and, and it's interesting, and, and I'm preaching for a, it's a confirmation and the uh, opening of a new church. And wow. so what, what struck me, it, you, you think, so who are we in this parable? Uh, it, it, because Jesus, in the interpretation, unfortunately, the, the lectionary on Sunday, they leave out an important chunk, mm. which is basically Jesus saying, um, you know, it's it, it, I, I, I speak in parables and they're enigmatic, as you say, they're enigmatic. Mm. Um, and and then you have to kind of ask, well, what's what what's the enigma about? Mm. And I suppose so I'm jumping about here, but I suppose just taking my own example. I know the story. I could tell you the story. Mm. Have I ever really thought about it or teased out what it actually means? Mm. And am I actually only finally cracking the enigma now, 44 years in? So um, so in that sense, I, can, I thought, oh, yes, OK, I, maybe I get this enigmatic nature, that it's something that you get you you stop at the story rather than saying what did, where am i in this or what is this about what is mm. where is god in this too anyway where i have ended up at the moment um and i have to write this tonight so it can be translated into swahili um where i'm at the moment is thinking okay confirmation is a new beginning building a church a new beginning they are seeds so what the, the key question for me is, let's see ourselves as the seeds in this story. And not so much where we are being scattered, but where we find ourselves and the sorts of uh, pressures, challenges, uh, hostile environments and so forth that are inimical to the seed that I am multiplying in its fruit. Mm. And, and so, you know, there are times in my life when it does feel like I'm being just choked by thorns and thistles. Mm. There are times when um, it's all very exciting and, uh, and then the sun comes up and scorches. Uh, uh, but there are times, and, and we know those times, when we are, as it were, in the right place, uh, we've got our roots down, we're well nourished, and and you can see the fruit. So I, that's that's where I. Found. So so what's why is Jesus telling this parable? I I I suppose from from my perspective, I'm thinking this is about paying attention to seeking out those spaces and times when 
that fruit is possible. Um, but recognising, because of the way in which the story is shaped, recognising that this will, this is, this is by grace. And, um, and, and we, it, it's not, the, the fruit doesn't come because we worked hard at it. Mm. The fruit comes because we have been in some way aligned with the good soil. Um, and I go back to the uh, that image in uh, in John's Gospel about the um, I am the vine and you are the branches, hmm. or the probably more accurate translation, um, I am the vineyard and you are the vines, hmm. and therefore being planted in the right place is how you will bear fruit. So that that's does that make sense? That makes sense. Yeah, makes good sense. Let me give you an alternative reading. <laughs> <laughs> given given that it is enigmatic, um, so I don't know if you've heard of the Baptist minister Howard Finster. I have not heard of the Baptist minister Howard Finster. Howard Finster added up that he had uh, preached four thousand six hundred and twenty five sermons. He had led 400 plus funerals, 200 plus weddings, and he audited what it was that his people had taken from this. And he found that nobody could remember a word he'd said at any of these. <laughs> so he decided to resign his ministry and instead uh, took up the mending of broken things, a bit like uh, Kintsugi, that Japanese art, and became very well known for it and also became known as an artist. And actually produced some album covers that are very famous for R.E.M. and for Talking Heads. Those great pop groups you all have heard of. Um, <laughs> including on the album covers, lots of quotes of the person of Jesus on them. Right. So quite a different ministry. And I mention that because here is some, somebody who may have felt he was scattering all sorts of seed on soil that was just mm -hmm. totally unreceptive. And if... Some of the recent findings about our ability to concentrate or anything to go on, that we've now reduced our concentration span from the year 2000 of 11 seconds to now eight seconds in 2015, or that, you know, most people can't remember an item of news a few minutes after it's been spoken. There's arguably uh, quite a case here for us to recognise that when Jesus talks about seed landing on the path, there's an awful lot of that in our present experience. Yeah. So th there's something about that that can resonate. Ditto, the, the, the seed that lands on the shallow soil, the rocky ground, which does immediately take, but actually as soon as trials and tribulations come up, it's in, in trouble. And I think here, for instance, of uh, people like Margaret, Margaret Heffernan's work on willful blindness yeah, yeah. and how it is that actually what we're looking for all the time is confirmation. We read blogs, we read books that kind of confirm our opinion and that resonate with what we're thinking. And actually, we kind of miss, ignore or simply don't face up to all the stuff that actually might not confirm, which is actually perhaps where the stretch begins mm -hmm. and where the possibilities for growth come in. That's the trials and the tribulations or an example of them. Then thirdly, You've got the stuff that the, the seed that lands on the thorns and what Jesus describes these as uh, uh, are uh, the cares of this world or riches or other desires come in. Uh, Stanley Howass makes a lot of riches. He says, isn't it interesting that we rather neglect this? We comfortable Western Christians that actually riches are going to come between you and the growth mm -hmm. of the seed in the soil. Uh, and, and how do we get round this? Well, we regard everybody rich who's got more than us, but <laughs> we're yeah. not quite rich enough. But he said this should be a salutary and sobering moment of teaching from Jesus for us to consider. And then you've got the seed that actually, um, you know, multiplies a hundredfold, sixtyfold and thirtyfold. Uh, who knows? Is that something to do with people like Martin Luther King and Dietrich Bonhoeffer? We don't know. But one way of looking at this is that we are 
the different soils and which kind of soil we are. One way is that we are the seeds, but another way of looking at it is to actually ask, what is what is Jesus saying first and foremost here about God? Mm-hmm. Yeah, what is what is Jesus saying about God here? Well, one thing that appears to be being said is that God is scattering seed all over the shop mm-hmm. in a way in which most people wouldn't. Mm-hmm. You know, would you simply scatter it all over mm-hmm. the possible different soils of life? This doesn't make much agricultural or farming sense, does it? Why on earth would you do it in that way? And arguably. There's an extravagance to the way in which God is sowing seed, but there's also something here, a clue in our own lives to the fact that the seed is sown in all the different parts of our life. Because we know that we can, we have all of the different soils within our own life and have experienced all the lists that I've just spoken about mm-hmm. in our own attitude and reception or lack of reception of the word. So, so how is it that in all the seasons of our life, we're looking for the generous sower who has sown in our lives the possibilities for fruit, come what may. I I think, for example, of a a parishioner of mine who um, uh, another parishioner was complimenting her on the fact that she seemed to have dealt with a particular adverse circumstance very well. And she said, "Um, I thank God every day for my cheerful disposition. Uh, she, She felt that what God had sown in her was a cheerful yeah, disposition yeah. that meant, come what may, yeah. come what kind of soil, there were the possibilities for fruitfulness. Yeah. So something here also in the parable about what this is saying about the nature of the divine. And just to pick, to go back to your uh, minister who preached, Howard Finster. Pre- preached 4,000 sermons <laughs> that nobody could remember, if he told 4,000 stories, hmm. they would have remembered them. They'd remember some of them. And, and Jesus did not preach 4,000 sermons. No. He told stories. Hmm. And we remember the stories, and then we have to figure out what they mean. Hmm. Which is why we're still talking about them 2,000 years later. Yeah.